Salut, mon nom c'est Olivier Coapel et vous regardez Variant Edition. Hi and welcome to Variant Edition, your first weekly video podcast show about comics and comic culture. My name is Mike. And I'm Kevin. And we've got a pretty good show for you today. We've got The Scorpion. It's not a Bowen. No, this is a Bowen. This is a Bowen? This is a Bowen. But we don't have just a Bowen this week. We've got another one, too. You know, so we're fair and balanced. Take that, you complainers about the Bowen-only statue reviews. Yeah, there's more than Bowen out there. Oh, yeah. It's yeah. just not always as good. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but, no, we got a good show. we got reviews. we got comic reviews. You've got reviews. I've got reviews. Lewis has reviews. And Lewis, he's graduating from his role of intern. Well, if he does a good job, he's graduating from his role of intern. And uh, the, the big thing tonight is, or whenever you're watching this, is we have a, uh, an interview with Olivier Coipel from back when we were in uh, Baltimore at the Baltimore Comic Con that Ricky did. So we've got, still got a little bit of Ricky. And that thing in the beginning of the show was in French for, I am Olivier Coipel and you're watching Variant Edition. Yeah. He was kind enough to do it in French, even though I'm sure, well, our international viewers will know what it is. I think we have like two people who can speak French. Yeah. So hopefully we'll see how this goes. So that's enough of us talking and uh, BSing over here. We're just going to jump over to Nick with the news. Hi, I'm Nick, and this is the news for the week of Wednesday, November 8th, 2006. Hey, Civil War fans. Marvel let a pretty major chapter slip by your radars. Black Panther number 21 didn't appear on any of the checklists and shipped without the signature cover treatment. But as usual, don't judge that book by its cover. Black Panther and Storm's decision to enter Civil War at the end of Black Panther number 21 has led to the issue to sell out at Diamond. Marvel has planned a reprint to let those late to the game catch up. This will make sure that issue 22 ships with the Civil War cover treatment. Sounds like the one hand didn't know what the other was doing with this one. Now for some Aquaman news, because, well, doesn't everybody like Aquaman? No. Current writer Kurt Busaic will be stepping down from the title at issue number 49 to be replaced by fantasy author Tad Williams. Busaic is moving on to a secret project to be announced later. Williams steps in and inherits everyone's favorite fish-talking superhero. Good luck. In further DC shuffling, Jamal Igel, previously the artist for Firestorm, will be joining now permanent writer Marv Wolfman on Nightwing with issue 129. It's no surprise to regular viewers that we here at Variant Edition are pretty big zombie fans. Hell, even I review at least three different zombie books every month. But the biggest selling title? That's right, Marvel Zombies, and it's making a comeback. Expect a 48-page prequel in May, Marvel Zombies Dead Days, by series creators Robert Kirkman and Sean Phillips. But that's not it. There will also be a five-issue miniseries teaming up the Marvel Zombies with Ash. Yes, that's right, Marvel Zombies vs. the Army of Darkness. Well, it can't be any worse than Army of Darkness vs. Reanimator. Shepherded by Kirkman, the mini will be written by John Lehman, with art by Fabiano Neves, and covers by Arthur Soydam. In 2007, zombies will be the new black. Or is it gray? Eh. This week's movie news sees The Incredible Hulk, the sequel to Ang Lee's first Hulk film, to be slotted for a June 27, 2008 release. Few details have been released, but fans should expect a high-octane event film rather than the angst-ridden sensitivity fest of the first film. And in DVD news, expect an extended cut of 2004's Punisher film. The new DVD, to be released November 21st, will have 17 minutes of additional footage and a new animated scene that would have been the movie's opening sequence if not for budget constraints. While Superman Returns may not have wowed at the multiplexes, that doesn't mean that gamers won't get a chance to take on the role of the Man of Steel. Scheduled for a release to coincide with the DVD release, the upcoming video game will let fans take on familiar comic and film foes on the next generation systems. And since we're talking about Steel, how about a little iron? Iron Man, that is. Sega announced this week that it has signed a worldwide licensing agreement for the exclusive video game rights for both the comic and movie versions of Iron Man. Expect a game for next generation systems to appear simultaneously with the upcoming film in 2008. In convention news, anybody local to the New York City area is in for a few good cons in the next few months. First up is The National, November 17th through the 19th. Held annually at the Penn Plaza Hotel in New York City, this year we'll again see a pretty impressive guest list, including Val Kilmer, Adam West, Travis Charest, Bernie Wrightson, John Romita Jr. and Sr., Michael Golden, and more. Check out BigAppleCon.com for a complete list. 
And while it may be more than four months until the second New York Comic Con in February, both dealer and exhibitor spaces are sold out. Fans should expect another record-breaking show. And while it is sold out, at least we got a table. Yep, Variant Edition will be there to cover it. Expect no more news about the upcoming con in upcoming episodes. That's it for the news this week. Join me later in the episode for my review of Savage Brothers number 2. But up first, it's Mike Swistak with the Toy and Statue Review. Hey there, this is Variant Edition Toy and Statue Review. I'm Mike. And I'm Jen. How you guys doing? What's up? Today we got two nice ones, okay? We got a scorpion statue. Sculpted by Mark Newman. Yeah, which he's, he's awesome. From Bowen Designs. Limited to 1,000. Classic Spider-Man villain. Done wonderfully. This here, this, you know, not sculpted by Bowen. Sculpted by this guy, Mark Newman, who's been sculpting a long time. Uh, was big in the garage kit industry early on beautiful piece. Uh, this is right up my alley. He's got amazing musculature, awesome detail, and the paint is probably the nicest it's part. It's a beautiful paint job. The green is so nicely metallic and like pearlescent. Yeah, it's and shiny. it's all, it's not just one mm -mm. tone of metallic no, green. There's no. metallic green, subtle gold metallic, yellow metallic. Right. It's 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 hot. You, you know. see it up close. It's great. On the high parts of his muscle, it's a nice like lighter yellowish green, and on the low parts, it's a nice darker green. It's beautiful. Yep. All of the lines, all the segments in his body are all black lined. Nice. The base, the brickwork, the sculpture, oh. and painting of the base it's is amazing. Awesome. Um, the, 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 there was a little talk here earlier that possibly his boots should have maybe had a little dirt on them, you know, but that, yay, yeah, yeah, I won't hold that against it. A beautiful, beautiful, what did you say, it was limited to 1,000, 1, which is actually kind of low for, for a Bowen statue, yeah. although they have been doing that with some of the non-hero characters yeah, as yeah, of they late. Have, they've been so. keeping some low numbers, so it makes it highly collectible, so yep. if you are interested in getting one, then you might want to... Hurry up quick and get one. Soon. Yeah, he's like 160, but awesome. He's a 14 inches tall, uh, 12 and a half inches tall, 13 inches tall, but still really cool. Awesome pose, nice dynamic. Again, great musculature, real pissed looking face. He's really nice. I, I know uh, we catch a little slack because we're always doing Bowens, but Bowens where it's at, yeah. man. If you're into comic books and you're into comic book characters, you're not getting much nicer than Bowen Design doing the stuff. I mean, that's where it's at. I don't do many negative reviews because there's so much yeah. good stuff out there now. I'd rather talk positive about statues. I love them so much than be harsh on something when we could just do something nice instead of looking right. at the crap. You know, they have a lot of quality pieces out, a lot of things that will look really great in your collection, and you know, why go on and on about things that you nah, really you don't want, suck. you don't need? Yeah. Why you mention them? It's under the rug with them, because, hey, <laughs> you know? All right. Bowen, Scorpion, Mark Newman, awesome. Awesome. Okay, and we go over <laughs> here. This guy here. This is a little different. This is uh, Gentle Giants, another classic, classic oh, company. Yeah. They've been doing the Star Wars the all kinds the star wars realistic busts the clone war statues they're doing lord of the rings they're doing harry potter they're all over oh, the yeah, place yeah they got everything this is from the red star and red star is a comic this is one of the main characters Kaiozo, i guess it is kaizo Kaiozo guardsman i don't know Russia. guardsman but awesome piece awesome piece um He's, uh, you know, the idea is a futuristic, post-apocalyptic world, somewhat Russia, magic has been reintroduced. He's a guard for one of the main chicks. I don't know her name. She's coming. I ordered her. She's coming. But I got this one. He's amazing. He's got this big-ass cannon, it's big huge. bladed knife sword in his back yeah. that's actually made out of metal. Um really nice piece and it's like a $40 bust it's uh, so well you know, worth it it's really nice um, some subtle things in him were a little different than how I envisioned him and also how they're, they're different than how he is in a box right. on a box his armor is more just a a metal -y look and on him it's it's white but it's nicely yeah. done I, I won't say that I'm not going to make a few little tiny changes to him some black line in here and there a little uh, you know a little bit of damage and dirt on some of his white armor. A little dry brushing on the gun would be nice just to bring out some of the metallic highlights yeah, of it. Yeah, but a great dynamic pose. The way that he's rocked leaning oh, back yeah. with the, the big gun holding out in front of him, the, the ammo belt, he's a nice piece. Again, yeah. kind of something you probably have to be into or know what it was unless you're just a 
sculpture maniac like I am, <laughs> but a cool piece. I mean, 40 bucks. You know, he's a decent size. He's got great attitude. Uh, I ordered him just from seeing him in the previews, but I'm quite happy with him. You know, even though I've never read the comic and hardly anyone's ever seen the video game practically but the people who worked on it but very cool a little bit more obscure than something like this where most of the people watching the show it's like, oh yeah scorpion but nice i felt they eh, you know i'll bring him in and show him because he's a little bit different a little bit different and there is there is a, he is a comic character though so but uh but nice nice nonetheless all right there so i believe that's it for this evening sounds good to me have a good one out there. Spend some money, not just on comics. Buy a statue or two, you know? Make yourself happy. It's good for you. Good for you, good for you to bring home a nice, solid hero or villain, you know? Does good. All right, dear. Take care. Take care. So my first review this week is New X-Men number 32. Now, I've become quite the diehard fan of New X-Men, and uh, if you're not reading this series, I don't know why you're not reading this series yet. Pick it up, start reading it, catch back up. It's, it's been a great story. I mean, they just fought Nimrod. Nimrod ver version 2.0 at that, so you just have to love this book. There's no reason not to love this book. They're restarting a New X-Men team. Uh, it's it's got a lot of great characters in it that sort of mirror other characters that have been in the X-Men before but either haven't stayed around or ended up dying. It's just a great story all around. Anyway, in this issue, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, there's been a lot of death going on since after M-Day and the whole Nimrod thing, so it's there's a funeral in here and that's not really the, the biggest point in the book. The biggest point is comes from a character uh, named Kevin who has, who his uh, code name I guess would be Wither. And uh, Wither kills people. Uh, he's got a death touch, uh, just like many other people in the past. He has the, you know, I touch you, you're dead, you wither apart, and that's why they call him wither. Uh, quite the counter opposite to Foley, who was also known as Elixir, who's been in a coma, who came back at the end, you know, I told you guys about that last time. Anyway, it would appear that Foley now has the, uh, the ability to heal and kill, and it's, it's uh, usually he's gold, but whenever he goes into killing mode, he turns black. So that's kind of like how you know it. He has like a death touch, kind of like Wither does, but now he's also got the healing, so he's a little bit cooler. Yeah, Wither, he's hanging out with this old chick who's about to die, and apparently she's been running around killing people, unbeknownst to anybody else. And I, she looks like the Black Queen, but it says that she's immortal, so I'm going to say that it's death dressed up like the Black Queen, and she wants Wither to, you know, be her partner and hang out and stuff. I want to see where it's going. It's it's always fun to see a, a, a godlike figure like Death teaming up with like a little innocent teenager like Kevin. Um, looking forward to it. Hope you guys are too. So this week I took a look at a new Superman book that came out, um, Superman Confidential by Darwin Cook and Tim Sale. Um, it's part of DC's new There's Going to Be a Superman Confidential and then in a few months a Batman Confidential. It's kind of like the whole... Batman Legends of the Dark Knight thing where they're telling stories that aren't necessarily in continuity like at the moment, but they're kind of like cool stories that involve the characters. Um, in this first arc, it's Superman and kind of like the origin of Kryptonite, I guess. It's very early in Superman's days in Metropolis. Um, and he's, you know, taking on these different things, saving people, you know, being Superman. And the whole time he's saying, oh, everyone thinks I'm invulnerable. I wonder if I really am. You know, the foreshadowing is kind of like a little heavy on this. But, I mean, when you see the first couple pages and there's like this big, huge kryptonite rock kind of narrating itself, you kind of know what's happening. But, very ably told. Um, the art by Tim Sale, I mean, maybe I'm just a big fan of his. I really like his stuff. Um, but he definitely, definitely strong. And his Superman is not quite as big and huge as he was in like Superman Man of All Seasons and some of his other things. So it kind of fits like the whole early kind of tales. And there's also some stuff with Superman, you know, as a reporter working with um, Jimmy Olsen and Lois Lane on a piece where they're trying to uncover this casino guy. Yeah, it, it's actually pretty cool. You know, the first issue is kind of a setup thing, but uh, I like where it's going. And if anything, it just kind of. It reminds me a lot of All-Star Superman. This kind of could have been an All-Star Superman tale because it's kind of timeless, kind of, you know, just a good Superman story. And it kind of makes me miss, you know, I wish All-Star Superman was monthly like this one's going to be. If it continues on the, you know, the pace that this first one started, I think it's going to be pretty good. All right, guys, so this week I reviewed Phoenix War Song issue three. Last time we left off, the uh, Stepford Kukos had uh, returned to uh, what used to be the Weapons Plus base called The World. 
and what it is, they stumbled upon a whole bunch of clones of what looked like themselves. So we see in this issue is that they are actually, obviously, clones, but the weird thing is, what was really creepy is that they're actually all stem from embryos and eggs from Emma Frost's DNA. So technically they're Emma's daughters, clones, it was really awkward. So they get to the world, they meet up with a doctor who's been conducting these experiments for like, who knows how long, and they learn that they're a part of this bigger plan which is yet to be revealed. But what's still lingering is like the whole Phoenix issue, which is really strong in Phoebe and not in everybody else. Okay, so Cyclops and the rest of the team show up and debating whether they should rescue the Stepford Cuckoos or actually kill them. Meanwhile, Emma's debating whether she should really tap into their minds and try to help them out or lobotomize them, like, and just wipe their brains clean so they can't do anything. So Emma ends up getting attacked by, like, this weird machine that sucks in the other two Stepford Cuckoos, and Phoebe gets really mad, and the Phoenix is unleashed within her. So she w ends up blowing up half the whole world um, headquarters and, like, leaving Cyclops unconscious, Wolverine's knocked out, and Emma's left with the three resurrected Cuckoos and debating whether she should now kill them or let them go. So it's a really good read, and I didn't see that twist coming at all with the whole clones and everything, but the whole Phoenix issue is still kind of like up in the air. So it's a really good read. I recommend it. And if you haven't been like all up to date on the whole Phoenix things, there's always collections to go out and go pick up, or you know, you could always Wikipedia of it because it's a really confusing topic of the X Men history. But good read. War Song Number 3 is really good. Back at the Baltimore Comic Con, we had so many interviews that we had to take care of, so you're still kind of be getting those in, in the next episodes, in the past episodes. But the one you're about to see now was the interview we were fortunate enough to get with Olivia Coipel. Now, Ricky was able to get the interview and sit down with him and kind of pick his brain, see why he does what he does. So, here it is. Enjoy. Hi, this is Ricky, Baltimore Comic Con, and I'm honored to be joined by Olivier Coipel. Thank you for joining me, sir. I really Hi. appreciate this. <laughs> It's an honor to really meet you. New Avengers, I'm a huge fan of. Oh, so thank you. <laughs> your work is great. And I'm going to start off on that. You coming from, you know, uh, Europe, what was it like taking your art from over there and kind of almost transferring it to, like, America's type of art? Did you have to change any of your styles mm -hmm. or any of your, you know, like your panel work or anything like that? No, mostly my style. I mean, um uh, but it was a long time ago. You know, I started to do when I, I had to. I knew that I had to do a portfolio to show it to to, um, to the editors. Mm -hmm. I started to train to, to, to do American style comics. Okay. About the lines, especially about the lines. You know. Mm -hmm. So um, I did I did that for um, a year, I guess. Okay. And then uh, it came up to the style that I have right now. I mean, now it's not an effort anymore. I mean, it wasn't an effort. It was just something that I wanted to change, mm -hmm. and uh, now it's become it becomes natural. Okay. And how would you say, like, artists in France, how would it differ to American artists? What's the main difference between each? Mm, I think the, the, the difference, uh, okay, obviously the style is different. Yes. But um, I'm talking more about uh, I'm, um, European artists. Mm -hmm. I say they have different styles. I mean, each of them mm -hmm. have uh, different styles. So I it's, it's kind of like America where everyone has their definitive style and it's yes. their style alone yes but I, uh, what I mean is that uh, people they can from a book to another change mm -hmm. styles okay it won't be like a problem okay because people want to try different things out yeah and I guess here if you do that people don't won't understand I mean uh, don't understand that I mean uh, why would you, would you change your style totally differently okay I okay. understand I understand and uh, if you're talking about the style itself mm -hmm. um, I guess the proportions. Okay. I mean, it's more. Uh, I'd say in uh, Europe, it's more realistic uh, proportions. Okay. Where people are more what they look like in life. Now, when you came over from Europe, how did you get hooked up with Marvel? Um, okay, uh, I was in Europe, but I moved to uh, to Los Angeles for four years mm -hmm. because I was in animation. Okay. So uh, um, from then. From there, uh, I went to San Diego Comic Con. Okay. And I showed my portfolio to DC Comics. Okay. And I got hired by them, by them. And then when I was working for the DC, Marvel called me. Oh. They just called me. Wow. Yeah. That's that's luck, man. That doesn't happen a lot over no. here in America. No. And at the beginning, I tell you, at the beginning, uh, I was saying no because I received several calls. Mm -hmm. And at the beginning, I was like, no, I'm well at DC. I don't want to move. And then they 
kept talking to me. Mm -hmm. And then after a while, I said, oh, why not? And then the money talked. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> no, but that says a lot about no, your no, art, man. Not, uh, yeah, that's the money, of course. Mm -hmm. But the fact that when I grew up, uh, in France, mm -hmm. mostly uh, Marvel comics were uh, published there, not okay. DC comics. So for me, uh, when Marvel called me, I mean, all the characters that I knew when I was a kid, I was able to draw them. Oh, and you already the, knew them. Yeah, yeah, that's great. And, you know, like I said, it just says a lot about your artwork, that Marvel comes to you. Your artwork is outstanding, and it stands out from a lot of other people. Oh, thanks. Have a lot of people stated that to you, that you're, you know, you're not normal for an American artist. You're very... You could definitely see a European influence in your art, and it's very nice. It's, re it's very refreshing to yeah. the whole comic book industry as a whole. But see, I'm, uh, I, was, I just came out from a panel, and mm -hmm. people were saying that, and I'm surprised when I hear that. Yeah. Because I can't tell. I really can't tell. Yeah. Well, you know, like a lot of artists will say that, that they're, eh, it's nothing special. But to us, it's like very refreshing to see a, a character that we've seen so many times yeah. almost kind of reinvented by another artist, just by the way he's drawn, it's very nice to see that, and you accomplish that very oh, that's nicely. That's nice, but um, see, I'm wondering, I mean, I, I would like to, someone to tell me, to point me out, what, what the, the what's the difference. What's wrong? Yeah, no, what's the difference, I mean. Uh, what, what you mean, the, the difference between, you know, like, someone else that would do a character yes, and you doing yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, since the beginning, I always want the people to, to, to feel that they're still human, that the characters are mm -hmm. human, and by that, you can um, contrast the situation with the, the um, I would say, the weakness of, of the body, I mm -hmm. guess. So yeah. um, by m making them more humans, you get to to, uh, to make them more extraordinary. Uh, extraordinary. Extraordinary. Extraordinary, yeah. There it is. Whatever. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, I mean, your style is very unique, and I love what you do. So with projects, you did New Avengers. Mm -hmm. You've done a multitude of Uncanny X-Men you've done. Yeah. What do you have coming up next? Uh, okay, so now there's a Spider-Man. I just finished a Spider-Man story by, uh, written by Stanley, Lee, mm, old-fashioned nice. way. So it's a, it was a fun one to do. Were you involved with Stanley on that, like directly? No. No? No. But all of them, <laughs> I mean, because I live in France. Mm -hmm. it's like I just uh, have an email from them, and that's it. Oh, okay. You know, or a phone call sometime when I'm lucky, but that's it. Mm -hmm. And is there anything else you got coming out? Yeah, but I cannot talk about it right now. No. Mm, <laughs> Civil War, maybe? I <laughs> don't know. Talk. Well, whatever it is, I'm highly looking forward to it. I love your work. Uh, thanks. And thank you very much for doing the interview, sir. Thank I appreciate you. it. Well, it's been a long time since I've even thought about the Savage Brothers, and then I thought about them when I saw issue two, and I said, hey, it's a long time since I thought about, you see where I'm going with this. But anyway, issue two of Savage Brothers was awesome. It's, it's good to see a book that's not so hung up on the generic trying to be George Romero zombie comic which is great. These aren't your normal zombies. They're apocalyptic zombies. Who knows what could have happened to them in a post-apocalyptic uh, post world. Could have been radiation, demons, some kind of chemicals, some kind of magic, some spell. Who knows? All we know is they're everywhere. And in issue two, it picks up right where issue one left, where they're going in to save this woman named Candy, who's going to be sacrificed by this head in a jar. So that's some nice sideburns. I like them. But anyway, they end up saving her from this guy, and all hell breaks loose. He gets pissed. He sends out the dogs after them, which are these really cool looking, they're kind of like humanoid bodies, a little bit elongated, with like big bat heads with huge ears and all that stuff. Nice mutant monster, not really zombies, just, you know, messed up things that came out of this post-apocalyptic world. So, they're on the lam from these guys because, you know, they saved this chick who he was going to sacrifice for this big scheme he had to end the world despite the fact that it's the apocalypse. But anyway, so, they're running from them, and they encounter a lot of interesting characters beyond just zombies. I mean, their zombies are very well done. The artwork in this issue is amazing. Nice, gritty zombies don't look too... I don't know, they, they lost a lot of human forms, like their jaws stretch out and things like that. Things definitely change when you become an undead post-apocalyptic zombie. How many times am I going to say that? But anyway, they have like a juggernaut type zombie where it's just this big massive hulk of a man. You know, he's got the little helmet on to keep his face pretty, I suppose. Busting through walls, chasing after these people. Chick stabs him in the eye with her shoe. Awesome stuff going on in this. So, 
Long story short, they escape from that and end into a whole new heap of trouble, which I'm hoping, well, which will end up in issue three, but it goes more into the, they're less, dealing less with zombies and more with a Dawn of the Dead type road warriors that seem to be these group of people who, you know, never lived by the rules before. Now they have no rules and they do whatever they want in this world. I'm definitely looking forward to it, and it's a nice break from everything that's so humdrum. So if you're paying attention, a you know a few episodes ago, I did a sort of advanced preview thing of a bunch of books that were in previews at the time, and one of them was Archaea Studio Press's upcoming The Killer. Well, last week The Killer came out. Um, it's by Matt and Luke Jackamon. Uh, it's a French import. It's going to be released in a ten-issue series, um, and like everything Archaea Studio Press has been doing, it's pretty impressive. Uh, you can tell that they take a lot of care in choosing their next projects so that they have a certain, you know, level of quality. You know, there's a lot of indie books you're kind of like, eh, they're not so bad. This is some pretty good stuff. It's basically about a hitman. Um, the first issue, it's kind of like the introduction to this guy. And he's basically just waiting for one of his hits. Um, waiting, you know, because he's very methodical. He's very patient. You know, basically he's a good hitman. Um, and he's waiting for one of his hits, so he's kind of like talking to himself, and you see a little bit about his past, how he conducts himself on his jobs, and you know, you, you kind of come to the conclusion that this guy has no conscience whatsoever, which is probably good for a hitman, but I kind of have a feeling might not be so good for himself as the story goes on. Um, you see him take out a few guys, and his, I don't know, his calling card, so to speak, is that he makes them look like accidents. So, I don't think I'm ever going to go scuba diving by myself after what I saw in there. But anyways, he's waiting for this guy, and the longer he's waiting for this guy, the more he's thinking. And, you know, anybody with a lot of time on their hands, sometimes that's a bad thing. And it seems like he might be going over that edge of sanity a little bit. So, at least that's where I think it's going. Um, very, very strong start. Very, very strong. I definitely would recommend this book. Um, if, if anything, just see where it's going to go. But, you know, another Archaea Studio Press hit. All right, guys, my last review for the week was Justice League of America, issue three. And when we last left off, we had Green Lantern, Hal Jordan. We had the new, I guess, the Red Arrow, what they're going by, Roy Harp, uh, Roy. And they had Black Canary. They had tracked down um, Dr. Ivo to his headquarters way up in the mountains. And like just as he revealed what his plot was, he had like an army of red tornadoes just come out and like start attacking uh, the three members of what is right now I call the fill in JLA because there's no official lineup yet. So they're going out with that. In the meantime, um, Red Tornado puts on his costume, and uh, if you haven't been keeping up, Red Tornado has a soul now. He has a real life living body, which he was granted by what appears to be Dead Man, but if you read the last issue, it's not. It's like this big setup by um, an outside like villain that hasn't been revealed yet and who looks like he's orchestrating the whole like hit behind the, the JLA. So Red Tornado's on his way to go find Dr. Evo and find out what's going on and meantime he runs into Phantom Stranger who like as far as I know hasn't been seen in DC Universe since like I don't know since forever so Phantom Stranger kind of alludes to like what's going on and like who's doing it to Red Tornado but he can't really tell him what's going on because he's not meant to do that he's only meant to lead the way so Red Tornado's following the beacon back to the mountains same place where like the rest of JLA is getting attacked and then we get a sneak peek of like a new Red Tornado what looks like a new Red Tornado being built by Dr. Evo and it looks like it's got key elements of like some supervillains and some superheroes into it to be like the ultimate android and then you had a uh, Black Lightning track down Parasite, who was sucking like B-list villains, like all their powers up, but we still have yet to see why. So he was attacked, but he thought the attack was being, you know, poised against him. It was actually to get Parasite out and take him back to the base where Eva was working on like the new android. So we see like Parasite's arm being taken off, put on the new android, and like the shadowy figure, like really pleased with what's going on, and Evo is like. As soon as the deal is, Evo, as soon as he's done building whatever it is for this new guy, he's going to be killed. And at the end, like the last panel, they hunch over one of the villains, and like on his neck is like this weird emblem, this weird squid looking thing. Which, if you know your DC history from the Silver Age, was when the JLA first got together and battled like this giant squid with like a big star in the middle. And I guess whoever is who was behind that, the original inception, 
might be behind this. I mean, that might be a total giveaway, but that's just too obvious. So there might be more to it. But it's a really good read so far. Like, and the as far as I'm concerned, the JLA membership is totally up in the air. Like, we don't even know if Batman's in, Superman's in, Wonder Woman's in. And this is Diana Wonder Woman, not Donna Wonder Woman. So, like, they're still debating on who are going to be the core members. I think it's going to be a completely, like, drastic new lineup with maybe one of the founding fathers. But we won't find out till maybe, like, a way later issue. But JLA, really good read. Highly recommended. Brad Meltzer doing an awesome job. And the artwork is just nothing short of great. So that was the show for this week. Great show. Yeah, pretty good show. Pretty good show. Decent. Lewis did a decent job. Yeah, I think a few more episodes and maybe he will graduate out of being intern. Yes, but let's not pay him just yet. No, 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 no. We'll, we'll milk this for a little longer. Definitely a little longer. So now it's, it's to my understanding that you have something to mention about? Yeah, I got an idea. Um, we've been at this for like, what, 34 episodes now? And, you know, we've worked out most of the kinks. And, we, you know, we know what we're doing. You know, we've been doing some interviews. We do reviews. We got the news. Um, but... You know, more people have been hearing about us, but I don't think enough people are hearing about us. So I actually heard from one of our fans, Jason, and um, he had suggested something that I had thought about, but we just never had any time to get the ball rolling. Um, he actually burned a copy of one of our shows, brought it to his comic book store, and they showed it in the store. And then he let me know that they people were actually asking, hey, what's that on the screen? So it kind of gave me an idea that we need to uh, promote the show a little bit. So, so you're saying one day I could be a famous television show person? Well, I wouldn't go that far, but... Uh, yeah, probably replace yeah. me with somebody better looking. Um, so basically, if you like the show, now is the time for you, know, you to show that you like the show. Um, so we're about to start our promotions. Um, we've got a couple of ads coming up. We're going to have some ads and some comics. Um, we're going to have some ads on the internet. You know, basically so that people who don't already know about the show can find out about us. But everyone who's watching already knows about the show. And, you know, you're probably thinking... Well, are, we, are we bribing them somehow? Well, maybe. Because, you know, they're probably thinking to themselves, how can lowly viewer become elevated to, to helping... High esteemed, to high esteemed Greatest viewer. fans of all time. Super fans. And one of the ways to do that is to spread the word. So we're going to give everybody a Green Lantern power ring and battery core, and they're going to spread out big variant edition constructs. Well, that'd probably get us in some legal trouble. Okay. Something much easier to do than that, though, is to start putting your money where your mouth is. If you like the show, start spreading the word. Tell your friends. Um, we're kind of considering this like a street team promotion kind of thing. Um, if you're on message boards, you have a blog, anything like that, I mean, put us on dig.com. Basically, spread the word. Um, we have YouTube videos. Share those. Put them on your blog. Put them on your website. Basically, if you like the show, there's probably a reason why. And there's probably people out there that you know that are going to like the show. It's the time to share that. Now, you're going to get something out of this. If you do something like that where you're spreading the good word, send us an email at fanmail at variantedition.com. Send us an email with a link or a screen grab or a picture or whatever of you spreading the word, and uh, we might have something good for you. We might have some goodies for you. The second way is... You know, kind of goes back to that DVD idea. Um, if you work at a comic book store, own a comic book store, whatever, and you have a TV with a DVD player and you want to show variant edition in your store, um, contact me, again, through fanmail at variantedition.com or kevin at variantedition.com, and I will send you a postcard with the latest episode, last couple episodes, and some postcards to put in your store. Um, and so you're probably thinking, well, what good does that get me other than happy customers who are being told what to buy because we actually hear back that people like our recommendations. Because people trust us. Exactly. Well, any store that does this, we will then consider you one of our affiliates. And we're going to put a link to your store on our website and we're going to mention every time we get a new affiliate on the show. So, you know, you get some free promotion. Everybody, you know, scratch my back, scratch your back, everybody kind of wins. Uh, quid pro quo. Exactly. I don't think I said now, that right, but... If you're just a fan, you know, not everyone out there owns comic book stores. But if you go to a comic book store that you know has a TV, you know, you can do like Jason, ask the store if they would show it in the store. If they will, again, contact me. We'll send you a DVD, send you some postcards, and uh, you can help spread the good word. 
And uh, we've got a lot of good stuff planned. We've got some convention coverage coming up. We've got a lot of stuff that's going to be going on in the next couple of months. So now is really time to spread that word, you know, kind of get the infection spread, so to speak. Um, so, you know, they're probably asking, what do you get? Well, we've got like mounds of t-shirts that we had made up at the beginning when is we started that what the those show. Are? That's what that is. I didn't know what that was. Yeah, now so we're going to start giving away t-shirts to people who promote the show. So, you know, we will reward you for your good deeds. I like the Green Lantern constructs better. Yeah, but, you know, we we'll live in a Hal Jordan world. on the phone. I have his number. I'm you good. do? I'm like this with him. Yeah, yeah, because well, I thought you and Kyle were like... No, Kyle and me aren't <laughs> like that. You dirty, dirty So boy. anyways, um, you want a t-shirt, spread the word. You know, we've got quite a few of them, and we'll probably give them out fairly regularly. You know, be the envy of your friends. Be the first cool kid on your block to have a very addition t-shirt. There you go. There you go. So that's that's uh, kind of the show for tonight. That's the show for the night. That's the show. That's my that's spiel. It. Okay. So um, the uh, the only other thing to say is we're going to do something a little weird for the next episode. Uh, should we tell them about that now or just let them be No, surprised? no, no. Let's tell about them now so that they can expect it. Okay. You want to do it? Or no, no. no you go, go ahead. Go ahead. You can let them know what you're doing next episode. Do I really have to? Because I'm kind of nervous about it. No, 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 let them know. Every we got to spread the good word of Mr. Riley. Ah, well, I had an interview with Mr. Rob Riley, a uh, big fan of his from Convention Professional. A uh, new artist in the block owns a small company called Scott Tunes. Big fan of his work, and he's got his latest uh, Convention Confessional number three is coming out in two weeks. Yeah, pretty soon. He just said he uh, just finished it, sent it to the printers. All right, so, so can't wait to get our hands on it. Yep. Yeah, so I got an interview with him, and we're going to run that next week, and you guys can see about the goodness that is Convention Confessional, and uh, love it just as yeah. much as I do. And the, the weird part that we're doing is we're actually going to release that episode on Monday. You know, now that we're getting everyone trained that we're doing our episodes on Thursday, um, we kind of decided we got so many interviews, and you know, there's not enough hours in the day already, so. Why not work a little harder? So we're going to do like a second week? Yeah, show? it's not going to happen every week where there's two oh, episodes in one week. my personal life. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, I sit at home on my computer all the time. Why not make it all the time? I sit at home on my computer, too, but I can't tell you what I do when I'm on the computer <laughs> at my home. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. But so look on Monday and then back again on Thursday. We'll have our regularly scheduled episode. But I uh, figured we'd try mixing it up a little so bit. So special Monday episode. Check it out next check Monday. Out. And um, November 17th, 18th, and 19th in New York City at Penn Plaza is the National. It's the big Apple Con. Once a year, they have, like, one big one, like the big three-day con. And we're going to be there. Are we? We're going to be there. We're going. Well, we're covering. Well, my schedule then. So if you're in the New York area, I'd say check it out. They're a pretty good con. And there's a lot of dealers and stuff, so it's it's actually a lot of fun. It's and hey, show. we'll be there, so stop by and say hi. And that's it. That's, that's it. that's it. That's it. That's the show. That's the show. Now, uh, please turn off your computers and step away. Go outside and live the good life. And buy some comics. And buy some comics. New York Comic Con is bigger, better, and is double the space, plus a table of us, with more gaming and anime for 2007. Come to the Jacob Javits Center February 23rd to the 25th and experience the biggest pop culture event in New York City, featuring comics, anime, manga, graphic novels, video games, trading card games, RPGs, MMOs, toys, movies, celebrities, and more. Guests of honor include Stan Lee, Jeff Smith, J. Michael Straczynski, and George Perez, with many more to be announced. For a complete list of guests, as well as the show information, visit NewYorkComicCon.com. Buy your tickets online now to ensure your spot for the 2007 show. Tickets are available now at discounted rates for advanced purchases at NewYorkComicCon.com. You can also book your travel arrangements online now on the travel page of the website. Don't miss out on the 2007 New York Comic Con. Visit our website to get all the information you need.